Thank you. Uh, before beginning my statement, Mr. Chairman, I would like to note that Congressman Jerry McNerney, a member of uh, the Congressional Committee that has oversight over this agency, C requested the opportunity to speak today. He was denied, uh, but I have a copy of a statement that the Congressman would have delivered had he, be, he been given the opportunity. And Mr. Chairman, with, uh, respectfully, I would um, ask that you include this in the official record of this proceeding, if you will allow. Without objection. Thank you. I dissent. I dissent from this spirally spun, legally lightweight, consumer harming, corporate enabling, destroying internet freedom order. I dissent because I am among the millions outraged. Outraged because the FCC pulls its own teeth, abdicating responsibility to protect the nation's broadband consumers. Now some may ask why are we witnessing such unprecedented groundswell of public support for keeping the 2015 net neutrality protections in place? Because the public can plainly see that a soon to be toothless FCC is handing the keys to the internet, the internet, one of the most remarkable, empowering, enabling inventions of our lifetime, over to a handful of multi-billion dollar corporations. And if passed its prologue, those very same broadband internet service providers that the majority says you should trust to do bright by you will put profits and shareholders' returns above what is best for you. Each of us raised our hands when we were sworn in as FCC commissioners. We took an oath and promised to uphold our duties and responsibilities to, I a liberal quote here, make available so far as possible to all the people of the United States without discrimination a rapid, efficient, nationwide, and worldwide wire and radio communication service with adequate facilities at reasonable charges. Today, the FCC majority is about to officially abandon that pledge and millions are watching and taking note. I do not believe that there are any FCC or congressional offices immune to the deluge of consumer outcry. We are even hearing about state and local offices fielding calls. And what is newsworthy that at last count, and I think the number is rising, five Republican members of Congress went on the record in calling for a halt to today's why such a bipartisan outcry? Because a large in favor of keeping strong net neutrality rules in place. But the saddest part to me about all of this, and it's painful for me to say this, that this is the new norm at the FCC, a norm where the majority ignores the will of the people, a norm where the majority stands idly by while the people that they are committed to serve, that they've taken an oath to serve, are about to lose so much. Now, we have heard story after story about what net neutrality means to consumers and small businesses, from places as diverse as Los Angeles Skid Row to Marietta, Ohio. I have here letters that just were sent to me that plead with the FCC to keep our net neutrality rules in place. But what is striking and in keeping with the new norm is that despite the millions of comments, letters, and calls received, this order cites not even one. That speaks volumes about the direction the current majority is heading, this FCC is heading, and that speaks volumes about just who is being heard at the FCC. Those sole proprietors whose entire business models depend on an open internet are worried that the absence of clear and enforceable net neutrality protections will result in higher cost and fewer benefits because, you see, they are not able to pay those tolls for premium access. Large online businesses have also weighed in, expressing concerns about being subject to added charges as they simply try to reach their own customers. Engineers have submitted comments 
including many of those internet pioneers. They shared with the FCC majority the fundamentals of how the internet works because from where they sit, there is no way that an item like this would ever see the light of day if the majority understood the platform that some of them helped to create. I have heard from innovators worried that we are standing up a mother may I regime where the broadband provider becomes the arbiter of acceptable online business models. And yes, I have heard from consumers who are worried given that their broadband providers have has already shown that they will charge inscrutable below the line fees, raise prices unexpectedly, and put consumers on hold for hours at a time. Who will have their best interests at heart in a world without clear and enforceable rules, overseen by an agency with by an agency uh, without any clear authority? Would that agency be a toothless FCC? Now there is a darker side to all of this that we have witnessed over the past few weeks. Threats and intimidation, personal attacks, Nazi cheering, Russian influence, fake comments. These are unacceptable. Some of these actions are illegal. They are all to be rejected. But what is also not acceptable is the FCC's refusal to cooperate with the state attorney general's investigations or allow evidence in the record that would undercut what can only be described as a preordained outcome. Now many have been asking me, what happens next? How will all of this net neutrality, my internet experience, look after today's decision? My answer is a simple one. When the current protections are abandoned, and the rules that have been in officially in place since 2015 are repealed, we will have a Cheshire Cat version of net neutrality. We will be in a world where regulatory substance fades to black, and all that is left is a broadband provider's toothy grin, because they have tooth, teeth, however you conjugate that. And those also comforting world, words we have every incentive, don't worry. We have every incentive to do the right thing. But what they will soon have is every incentive to do their own thing. Now the results of throwing out net neutrality protections may not be felt right away. Most of us will get up tomorrow morning, get ready for work, and over the next week, wade through what would be no doubt hundreds of headlines we will grow tired of those hundreds of headlines. We will grow tired hearing from endless uh, prognosticators, and we will quickly submerge ourselves into a sea of holiday bliss. But what we have wrought today will one day be apparent, and by then, when you really wake up and see what has changed, I fear it may be too late to do anything about it, because there will be no agency in power to address your concerns. This item insidiously ensures that the FCC will never be able to fully grasp the harm it may have unleashed on the internet ecosystem. And that inability might lead decision makers to conclude that the next internet startup that failed to flourish, that attempted to seek relief by whatever authority may or may not be in charge with how much, many teeth they might have left, simply that maybe they just had a bad business plan, when in fact, the actual corporate was the absence of a level playing field online. Particularly damning is what today's repeal would mean for marginalized groups like communities of color that rely on platforms like the internet to communicate. You see, traditional outlets rarely, if ever, consider their issues or concerns worthy of coverage. It was through social media, remember, that the world first heard about Ferguson, Missouri, because those legacy outlets did not consider them worthy enough for coverage until that hashtag started trending. It has been through online video services that targeted entertainment ecosystems thrive, where stories are finally being told because those very same 
programs that were submitted for consideration were rejected time and time again by mainstream media and distribution, media, media, mainstream distribution and media outlets. And it has been through secure messaging platforms where activists have communicated and organized for justice without gatekeepers who may or may not have differing opinions blocking them. Where will the next significant attack on internet freedom come from? Maybe from a broadband provider allowing its network to congest? Making a high traffic video provider ask, what more can it pay to make that pain go away? That will never happen, you say? Newsflash, it already has. The difference now is the open question of what is stopping them. The difference after today's vote is that no one will be able to stop them. Maybe several providers will quietly roll out pay prioritization practices, packages that will enable deep pocket players to cut the queue. Maybe a vertically integrated broadband provider decides that it will favor its own apps and services or some high value internet of things traffic will be subject to an additional fee. Maybe some of these actions will be cloaked under non-disclosure agreements and wrapped up in mandatory arbitration clauses so that it will be a breach of contract to disclose these, these publicly or take the provider to court if there is any wrongdoing. Some may say, of course this will never happen, but after today's vote, what will be in place to stop any of this? What we do know is that broadband providers did not even wait for the ink to dry on a proposed order before making their moves. One broadband provider who had in the past promised to not engage in pay prioritization has now quietly dropped that promise from its list of commitments on its website. What's next? Blocking or throttling? That will never happen, you say? After today's vote, exactly who is a cop on the beat that can, can or will stop them? And just who will be impacted the most? Consumers and small businesses, that's who. The internet continues to evolve and beca has become even more critical for every participant in our 20 first century ecosystems. Government services have migrated online, as have educational opportunities, job notices and applications, but at the same time, broadband providers have continued to consolidate. They have become bigger. They own their own content. They own their own media companies. And they own or have interest in other types of competing services. So why are millions of Americans so alarmed? Because they understand the risk this all poses. And even those who might not exactly know what it means when somebody says title to authority, what they know is that they will be at risk without it. Now I've been asking myself repeatedly why the majority is so single focused on overturning these wildly popular rules. Is it simply because they felt that the 2015 net neutrality order, which threw out over 700 rules, which dispensed with more than 25 provisions, was too heavy handed? Or is this a ploy to create a need for legislation where there was none before? Or is it to establish uncertainty where little previously existed? Is it a tactic to undermine the net neutrality protections adopted in 2015 that are currently parked at the Supreme Court? You know the very same rules that were resoundingly upheld by the DC Circuit last year? No doubt. We will see a rush to the courthouse, asking the Supreme Court to vacate and remand the substantive rules that we have fought so hard for over the past few years because today the FCC uses legally suspect means to clear the decks of substantive protections for consumers and competition. It is abundantly clear why we see so much bad process with this item because the fix 
was already in. There is no real mention of the thousands of net neutrality complaints filed by consumers. Why? The majority has refused to put them in the record while maintaining the rhetoric that there have no been, no been no real complaints or no real violations. Record evidence of massive incentives and abilities of broadband providers to act in anti-competitive ways are, are missing from the docket. Why? Because those in charge have refused to use the data and knowledge the agency does have and has relied on in the past to inform our merger reviews. As the majority has shown time and time again, the, in, the views of individuals do not matter, including the views of those who care deeply about the substance, but may not be Washington insiders. There is a basic fallacy underlying the majority's actions and rhetoric today. The assumptions of what the assumption of what is best for broadband providers is obviously what is best for America. Breathless claims about unshackling broadband services from unnecessary regulation are only about ensuring that broadband internet service providers have and maintain the keys to the internet. Assertions that this is merely a return to some imaginary status quo ante cannot hide the fact that this is the very first time that the Federal Communications Commission has dis disavowed substantive protections for consumers online. And when the current 2015 net neutrality rules are laid to waste, we may be left with no single authority with the power to protect consumers. Now this order loudly crows about handing over authority of broadband to the Federal Trade Commission, but what is absent from the order and glossed over in a haphazardly issued afterthought of a memorandum of understanding or MOU is that the FTC is an agency with no, no, none, nada, technical expertise in telecommunications. The FTC is an agency that may or may not even have authority over broadband providers in the first instance. The FTC is an agency that if you can even reach a very high bar of proving unfair or deceptive practices and that there is substantial consumer injury, it may take years upon years for any remedy uh, to be levied. And most companies don't have years and years to wait for an answer. But don't just take my word for it. Even one of the FTC's own commissioners heard, has articulated these very concerns. And if you are wondering why the FCC is preempting state consumer protection laws in this item without notice, let me help you with a simple jingle that you can easily commit to memory that will underscore all of this. If it benefits industry, preemption is good. If it benefits consumers, preemption is bad. Reclassification of broadband would do more than wreak havoc over net neutrality. It will also undermine our universal service construct for years to come, something which the order implicitly acknowledges. It will undermine the Lifeline program. It will weaken our ability to support robust broadband infrastructure deployment. And what we will soon find out is what a broadband market unencumbered by robust community consumer protections will look like. I suspect that it will not be very pretty. I know that there are many questions on the minds of Americans right now, including what the repeal of net neutrality will mean for them. To help understand or to answer or address outstanding questions, I plan to host a town hall through Twitter next week on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But what saddens me the most today is that the agency that is supposed to protect you is actually abandoning you. But what I am pleased to be able to say today is that the fight to save net neutrality does not end today. The agency does not have 
the final word. Thank goodness for that. And as I close my eulogy of the 2015 net neutrality rules, carefully crafted rules that actually struck an appropriate balance in providing consumer protections and enabling opportunities and investment. I actually take what I'll just call ironic comfort in the words of then Commissioner Pai back in 2015, because I believe this will ring true about this destroying internet freedom order. I am optimistic, he said, that we will look back on today's vote as an aberration, a temporary deviation from the bipartisan path that has served us so well. I don't know whether this plan will be vacated by a court, reversed by Congress, or overturned by a future commission, but I do believe that its days are numbered. Amen to that, Mr. Chairman. Amen to that. Thank you.